you're looking at the team there of Kenny Bernstein. We're going to see him on the uh, middle of the screen there. Absolutely inexplicable. The only thing that one might consider, Bobby indicated to us, Bobby Unser, how cold it is. And because of that, look, the car is damaged. Yeah, no question. He's out of the race. The tires may not have come up to full temperature. And maybe with that high torque engine, when he shifted gears, just suddenly. Boy, it, uh, oh, what a terrible situation for Roberto Guerrero. One of the nicest men. We thought that racing. he was making a true comeback. Of course, he was one of the uh, fastest and best drivers uh, in IndyCar racing in the mid 70s. He suffered a concussion uh, at this track in 1987 in a testing accident. He was in a coma for 17 days. And after that, and we're looking back now from the pace car, look on to the, look at the right there, Roberto. Wow. He appears to have just turned suddenly, doesn't he, Paul? I th Philippe Gage, the number 44 car. Very much the same sort of situation, I would say, Sam. Yes, certainly can suggest that the cold tires mated with over 700 horsepower as you're going up from second to third gear could produce that. It's obviously devastating for Roberto Guerrero. Capaldi with the new Chevy B engine. Gary Bettenhausen has a Buick. And a car into the wall. A teammate of Gary Bettenhausen's. Another one of the Buicks out of the Menard stable. It's... That's Tom Stevens' car. Yeah. Former winner of the race, and the front end heavily damaged there. Steve, of course, living out in the Phoenix area, developing golf courses and a new complex of baseball fields. Steve was trying to get out on his own. You saw him disconnect the steering wheel and pull it off. The front end of that car is damaged so badly, he could have some tanglement around his feet, Paul Reed, and he couldn't get out right away. The fire that they had on the left was a small, like oil-type fire that wasn't going to go anywhere but the big problem is going to be around his feet. Tom Steva has crashed in five of his last seven Indy 500 starts. Yeah, incredibly, he has not finished at all since he won this race in 1983, and of course, he continues that streak now. And you notice how the field, see, there's this debris all over the racetrack, and the field had to really come down. Look how close they are to the pit entrance, single file. <laughs> A lot of them, I'm sure, said, oh, why don't you just let us go down through the pits? Let's look at this situation as it developed with Tom Steva as we're under our second caution of the day. You can't help but think how close on the racetrack this happened to where Nelson Piquet also crashed. Look at Watch the this. upper part of the screen. That is a crash almost identical to Piquet's, Paul, Bobby. Very, he, very close. Lost it at the apex. He just flat lost it. It was just the rear end came loose. I don't think anything broke on the car. It was just simple matter. Another angle, same situation. And you can watch. It's right, Paul. It's the most likely place that a guy loses it at the very sharpest or the right down at the apex of the turn. Another look at the same accident from down right on top of the wall. Watch the yellow car. There it is. He did not hit directly head on, which is encouraging there. Uh, not as severe an impact as Piquet's was. The speed was lower and the angle was better. Let's have high hopes for Tom Sneva. So Tom Sneva loses control in the fourth turn, catches the wall on the outside, bringing on the second yellow light of the day. We'll return with more action from the Indy 500. After this message and a word from your race complete, we approach the halfway point in the Indy 500. People will look and say, well, Michael has this big lead. Things must be going awfully easy for him. But he has gotten the big lead by taking. And an accident. Oh. Two cars involved. Well, there was an unavoidable crash. The car Philip Gash, as he waves and says he's okay, but a second car got into that as he was spinning. Look at that. Boy, Debris like it everywhere. For, like it for a couple of feet, that boy could have been very unlucky, Philip Gash, because the car that went by him, which I didn't get the number yet, he went by so fast, Paul, but boy, it could have hit him right in the center there. Now, there's an interesting part of that rule that says the pits are closed. Somebody's hit him. He's got to have some damage. The chief steward, Tom Benford, said, now, if you really have a shredded tire or something and you have to come in, watch this. Watch this, Bobby. There's the spin. Yes. Philippe catches the wall. Oh. 
and Stan had oh, nowhere to go. Wow. And oh. that Stan was almost into a spin himself trying to miss him. There was nothing he could do, but I can't imagine how lucky that Stan Fox and Gash are that he didn't plug him right in the middle. Yeah. Watch this Another now. Oh, watch that. Doesn't show it as good there, but he was in a drift trying to go to the left to miss him. Very close. You know, that's a very unusual situation. You seldom see that kind of accident where one car is spinning and another car catches him anymore at Indy. Again, though, you see the components of the car tearing off and absorbing energy. Plus, when all, look at that tire and the parts going across. Often a driver behind doesn't know which one to try to miss. The Got rule it. at Indy used to be that you point at the car and then you'll miss it. Is that true anymore, Bobby? Yep. And there's another view of it. Gash loses control in the corner, slaps the wall. Now keep an eye on his car, Stan Fox. Pinched off by another car, fails to miss Gash's car. And Stan Fox is also out of the race. Looking at it from one more angle, Bobby. You know, one of the things that happens as you watch it, there's Gush out there hitting. Here comes the tires and the debris across. There's Stan Fox right there. You know, sometimes they don't know which to go for, the tire or the car. You saw a flash of what looked like smoke there for a second, and we've oh. got an accident. Several cars. Holy smokes. One of the Penske cars. It looks to be Fittipaldi. Emerson. It's Emerson, Emerson. Fittipaldi. Who had the been, wall right on that restart. Who'd been running third. He was one of two other cars on the same lap as Michael Andretti. Well, Emil had great fortune on the yellow. He was on the tail end of the lead lap, but was able to close up and get back into contention when the yellow came out. He looks to be all right. He's moving around in there an awful lot. The car doesn't look like it's been up all that bad, Paul. So I imagine Emo should be able to get popped out unless he's got something sticking his legs in or holding them in, rather. Well, what an unusual Indianapolis 500 this has become. The pole sitter, Roberto Guerrero, has his problem before the start of the race and tags the wall. We've seen an accident like we uh, haven't seen before between Gosh and Stan Fox. This is the view of this situation from Rick Mears on board camera. Mears had up ahead of steam. Whoa, Mears is going to be out of it, too. So Mears, it looks like, got involved with a Crawford car. Yep. Caught a quick glimpse of that both car Penske that came cars, around. Both Penske cars put out at the same instant. A single situation and two cars out and the second Bernstein car. Oh, and he was caught. There was absolutely no place to go. In other words, it just was a wedge right into the wall, plus into the green car. Crawford there also. Well, there is an example of when your number is up on this track, your number is up. There's just nowhere to hide on an oval with a big concrete wall around the outside of it. It looked as they came back to green. We saw a lot of dust coming up. The track, of course, they've run very hard on a lot of this track. Yeah. And there you see Emerson's problem. Emerson apparently got into some of the debris of that accident. Yeah, but I think he, there's Roger Penske. Well, he suffered a tremendous loss in the past few seconds. Boy, yeah. I mean, that's it's a lot of loss in just a short time, and you can look at Roger's face and see what his feelings now are. Now, take a look at it again. Okay, there's, there's the first impact, which involved Mears and Crawford, and, and there's fit Emerson fit, crashing at the top of the screen. And it would appear that Emma went down there and had a problem unrelated to the other. Incredible. Unless he ran over some debris. But he wasn't there right. yet. He wasn't at the scene of the accident yet. I don't think he could have been uh, running well, over well debris. Back. See? Look at that. There's impact number one, and now we're going to look at the now upper watch, right. Watch Fittipaldi running rather high. Yep. And comes yep. out from behind that other car. I think he may have just had to lift off really suddenly because of what he saw ahead. There's moments ago, Dominic Dobson, the 68 car, the left rear was not firmly attached when he spun up, ready to roll out of the pits. No damage as a result of that, but boy, they had to get the car back around before anyone else got into that area and get a wheel back on it. And look at, oh, and another car, and that's Mario. This involves Mario Andretti, you see him moving over toward the pit wall on the inside, Mario Andretti. Well, that's been more like a war zone today than it has been a race. We hardly get the race started, we have another crash. Very lucky for Michael Andretti. This will bring out a yellow, which will enable him to take care of his tire problem. Well, remember, Stan, we don't know that he has one. Let's tell everybody that, but he's just worried that he may have, and often the tires don't give a problem until you're in the middle of the turn. Now watch this as we ride with Mario. 
for the green to come out. The field strung out through the third turn now. The short shoot is ahead. But you just don't want to know. You just don't want to look. Ken just came loose. Yo! Oh. Boy, that gives you an idea how hard they hit here. Back end just came loose, just like you just said, Paul. There was, I don't think anybody else involved or anything else involved. Sixth time that a crash has taken Mario out of the Indy 500. He's failed to finish in 20 of 27 Indy races. And it's at the same place that turn four coming off. It's got to be slippery up there because we've seen a lot of problems. There. And that was a, a fairly head on angle into the wall. So we hope Mario is OK as we take a look at this situation again. This race has turned into a demo derby, basically. And yet, in a sense, it is also proof that today's technology in Indy cars can protect the driver. We've seen accident after accident without serious injury. It makes you wonder, why can't we have something like this for our passenger cars? I hope that in the next 10 or 15 years, the technology that we are seeing developed here at Indianapolis will start to be available widely for all of us who drive our families on the street. Well, it's been when he hit the wall. The cars that were running behind Mari all had to judge jog around there, including Bobby Rahal. You can watch this is the end in car in slow motion. Now watch his hands. He tries to correct it. Yeah. Now he remember knows. on a very good car that once it's gone sideways, you see he quits working the steering wheel because once you've gone so far sideways, there's nothing left to do with the steering wheel. Just ride it out and hope for the best after that. And did you see him push his head back into the headrest just before he yes. to the wall? Yeah. He, well, you don't get a whiplash. And pop he took precautions, there. that's for sure. That's the move of a veteran. Yeah. I bet he pulled his feet back in there, too. This view is right from the oh. wall that separates the main straight from the pits. Well, he hit that thing head on. I mean, it's bad. It has been seriously dangerous in turn four this year at Indianapolis. So a most unusual Indianapolis 500 is 84 laps old. Back at Indianapolis and still under the yellow.